Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and this is our traditional worship service. We're very excited to have you join us. And this morning, as we begin, we're going to invite you to stand as you are able and let us join together in the call to worship, which you will find on the screen. And if anyone loves righteousness, her labors are virtues, for she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable for mortals than these. And we're going to invite you to remain standing. This is our last total request, Hymn Sunday. And uh, this morning, some of you will be very excited to know that it is Christmas. <laughs> so we're going to start with 2.30 in the United Methodist <coughs> Hymnal, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Oh, happy this morning. It's like Christmas is here. So we're very excited to continue this. We'll have one last one at our closing, but thank you to everyone who's participated in that. Let us continue with our gathering liturgy, which you will find on your screens. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired her for his habitation. This shall be my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I delight in her. I will surely bless her provisions and satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation and her faithful people will rejoice and sing. There I will make the horn of David flourish. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. As for his enemies, I will clothe them with shame. But as for him, his crown will shine. Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. Let us continue with our unison prayer. Or not. 
No, he doesn't prove. Okay, never mind. Pause. Excuse me. I, I apologize for leading you astray. Uh, we're going to sing the Gloria Patri. What are we doing? But you have unison prayer. What am I doing right now, Gary? Unison prayer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, we are going to do a unison prayer. Then we're going to do the Gloria Patri. Hallelujah. All right, let us pray. <laughs> Teach us to listen, Lord. Quiet the noise of our lives so we can hear your voice. Amen. Now let us sing the Gloria Patri. <laughs> pondering for today from Augustine of Hippo. Let us leave a little room for reflection in our lives, room too for silence. Let us look within ourselves and see where there is some delightful hidden place inside where we can be free of noise and argument. Let us hear the word of God in stillness and perhaps we will then come to understand it. Wonderful words from that saint of the church. And so this morning now is children's time. If our children would like to come down here, I will share with you something. Come on down. How are you, gentlemen? Did y'all get a haircut? No? You're just looking real dapper today. Got it. All right, come on down here. So we've been talking in this worship series about change, right? Things change, right? You're getting bigger right? You, maybe you started a new school year, right? And so things change. So things have changed in a lot of ways. You know, we had a pandemic, and I don't know if you noticed that some things changed, right? Maybe you were spending more time at home, maybe your parents were spending more time at home, and things definitely changed. So one of the things that we had been doing at the church was on fifth Sundays, we would have a healing and a blessing, right? We would have a prayer for that, and we would do the anointing. Do you remember when we used to take the balm? And before the pandemic, we would put it on your forehead if you would liked it, but now we're still just doing the hand. So this is the balm that I use, right? You guys remember this balm, right? It smells like frankincense and myrrh, the gifts that the Magi brought to Jesus when he was born. So unfortunately, the company that makes my balm is no longer in existence. They went out of business during the pandemic because people weren't doing a lot of hands-on anointing in the pandemic. And so I'm almost to the end of my balm. And I thought, you know what? I need to figure this out because my only other choice is to go back to oil. Have you ever been anointed with oil? Sometimes it can be a little sticky and runny. And so uh, it's one of the reasons that I like to use the balm because it's not quite as messy for you. But unfortunately, with the company gone, I only found two people or two companies that are making balm and it's not quite the same. This one is petroleum based, which is more kind of like Vaseline. And then this is the first one I found. These are both with frankincense and myrrh. The first one is made with sweet almond oil, olive oil and shea butter and beeswax. And it sounds like ingredients for a cupcake to me. Um, but still, it smells pretty good, but it's definitely got like that almond smell to it. But I thought, you know what? There are people in our church that have nut allergies, and this would not be good. Like, this could make them feel really sick. And so we don't want you to come to church and then get sick, right? That wouldn't be good. And then at 9 o'clock, there was a little boy who was sitting here who was like, I'm allergic to peanuts. I was like, then we're definitely not using this one. We'll put that one away over here, right? We're not going to use that one, which leaves me with this one. And this one, well, it's not in as cool a case, but it's, it still smells like frankincense and myrrh. It doesn't smell quite as cool as the other one did, the one that I like to use before the pandemic. And it's, um, this one has in it extra virgin olive oil uh, be and beeswax and a little petroleum jelly. So it's kind of like the other one. It's got a little added stuff in it. But you know what? It's, I just don't like it as much, right? And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is probably my option, but I'm not real happy about it. So now Pastor Sarah has a problem. If something changes and I have to do something new, should I make sure that everybody is aware that I'm unhappy with it? 
You think that would be great next time when you come down and I'm like, here is the balm I don't like so much. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You don't think that would go well? No? It seems kind of rude too, right? I probably shouldn't do that. But I had a friend remind me this morning that, you know what? Maybe you should just acknowledge that it's not the same. And I was like, maybe that's true. You know, it's not bad. It's different, right? It's different. And I'm going to get used to it, right? Because I can remember the first time somebody anointed me with a balm, and I was like, that is so weird. Who does that? And then I, I wore it, and I was like, oh, I kind of like this better. And then it became my new thing, right? So here is what the church has to learn, right, is that we are always going to have things that change because everything's changing. We're getting older. We're getting better, right? We're supposed to be getting better, and things change. And sometimes they change, and we can't even help it, right? The company went out of business. If I had known that, I would have bought all the balm they had, right? But I, they, I didn't, didn't know, and I couldn't do it. So now I've got this balm. So what we're trying to do, all of us, is remember that when things change, it's how you think about the change, right? So what I can do next time we do this, and we'll do it in September, is I can go, you know what? This is different, but maybe I'm going to end up liking this more, or maybe this will feel better for you guys when I anoint you with it, right? Should I give it a try? I'm going to try. I'm going to try really hard, and I'm going to try to keep a, an outlook like that for more than just anointing balm. You think you could do the same thing? Awesome. Wonderful. All right, if you all would like to go to children's worship, Miss Laura is going to take you back there, and we will see you a little later in our service, okay? Thank you, gentlemen. And I will have to put this almond one very, very far away so that it never mistakenly gets used. Um, but we are grateful for, for the change that has happened that has made us better, and we are working through the change that has happened that we have not yet come to full grips with, but we are grateful for that. And so this morning, you're going to hear a beautiful musical offering from our chancel choir called Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Amen. May it be as you have sung. And now we're going to have our lectionary psalm reading by Lynn Ann Banks. Good morning. Good morning. This is a reading of Psalm 81, verses 1 and 10 through 16. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to God of Jacob. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their doom would last forever. I would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn. Before we hear our second scripture this morning, will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. God, you proclaim to us in the book of Revelation that you are making all things new. And your spirit continues to churn within us as individual disciples and within us as the body of Christ, mixing up for us new things and tradition and inviting us to be made new, not only in the forgiveness of our sins, but in the way in which we are present in the world as your ambassadors, your representatives, bearing the name of Christ, for we are Christians. And we pray, Lord, that as we confront change, whether it is for ourselves, our families, our neighborhoods, our church, our world, that you would give us a spirit of peace, that you would help us remember that at the beginning and end of every day and every moment in between, you are our God and we are yours. And there will be no fear in our hearts as long as we stay committed to that holy and eternal truth. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading now comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. And as we have been on our exploration of the history of Methodism, today we arrive at our present time. We have come through a very long journey, starting all the way back in England, and the Oxford Methodists, especially those two Wesley brothers, John and Charles, that have such a beloved place in the lives of our church, and what we preach and teach and what we sing and how we choose to be present in the world, and it has journeyed across the Atlantic Ocean. It has come to what was first the American colonies, and then the United States of America. 
And Methodism through this time has gone from being a part of the holiness movement. It has become part of a brand new expression, a denomination in Christianity. It has moved even beyond that to multiple expressions of Methodism. And last week, we recognized that at some point right before 1968, that the churches, the Methodist Episcopal Church in the north and the Methodist Episcopal Church south in the southern territories and countries, uh, countries, states, commonwealths, were working to try to figure out how to come back together. They recognized their brokenness, and so they did come back together as the Methodist Church, but they retained signs of their separation. You can still see vestiges of this in some of our Conferences, specifically our jurisdictional conferences. Jurisdictional conferences exist for one reason, and that is for the nomination, consecration, and appointing of bishops. And they are done regionally. So you'll be shocked to discover that the Southeastern Jurisdictional Conference runs from Virginia to Florida, doesn't go into DC, doesn't go into Maryland, and certainly would go no further north. And you might expect then, if you're looking at kind of a lateral line, that West Virginia would be in our jurisdictional conference, but oh no, no. Such was the lines that were drawn during the Civil War. West Virginia is in the Northeastern Jurisdictional Conference. And these exist because we do recognize that culturally we are a little distinct, but we also recognize that there weren't a lot of people in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, or Georgia who were excited at the prospect of having a bishop from the state of New York come down. And so we've preserved a culture and, and a, a system that allows us to know that the most Yankee clergy we'll get is from Northern Virginia. That's as close as we can get because this is the structure that we have. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we will tolerate change as long as it isn't too radical. And sometimes bringing vestiges of what we had makes us feel a little more comfortable. And so jurisdictional conferences reflect that brokenness. But... In 1968, we truly changed how we think about ourselves. Because what was happening was, even though they weren't really united in the way that you would hope they would come back together, the Northern Church of Methodism and the Southern Church of Methodism started to notice something. Have you ever done something like reconciliation and it worked and you're like, that actually was pretty good. Maybe I should try it again. If it worked for him, maybe it'll work for her. And so they were being encouraged by even what they had done coming back together. And they thought, let's keep doing this. Let's keep uniting with other Christians that understand God's grace central, foremost, and foundationally. And in 1968, in the hallowed city of Dallas, Texas, the Methodist Church joined with the Evangelical United Brethren. Now that church brings to us the United. That's where we get United Methodist Church. And the Evangelical United Brethren have a very different past. They have a very different genealogy, as it were. Now we trace ourselves very quickly back to the old established hierarchy of Christendom, right? We're Methodist, but it didn't take very long for us to recognize that Methodism in the United States came from an Anglican priest laying hands on people that were coming over here to ordain them to bring the sacraments to the rebelling colonies. And John Wesley was ordained in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. And the Church of England exists because there was a slight disagreement on how to dissolve a relationship in the Catholic Church. And so they traced themselves very quickly to the Catholic Church, and if you're a history fan, you'll love how I just smooth that over. And in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, they are very good at record keeping. They can trace themselves all the way back to the apostle Peter. And if you get to Peter, you get to Jesus. And that is our tradition. We are just a few hop, skips and a jump from the, not only the Roman Catholic Church, but the early church of the apostles, the apostolic church. And so we recognize that trajectory within Methodism. But the Evangelical United Brethren come from a different line altogether. They come from that other burgeoning beauty of the Protestant Reformation. They come from the side that is more akin to John Calvin and Congregationalist modeling of their po polity. They are a group that wanted to keep the power and the authority in the local congregation. 
And so if you come from the background of Disciples of Christ or Church of Christ or any of the lovely streams of Baptists, or you find yourself from some of those other denominations that really have a Congregationalist model, then the Evangelical United Brethren would probably resonate very deeply with you. But if you remember last week, I was talking about how they were yearning to come together with other Christians to do mission work and be successful there. And the Methodist Church had done that, and they started having conversations with other Christians. And as they started talking to the Evangelical United Brethren, they started to go, hey, we're all kind of speaking this grace talk. Maybe we could do more than just have conversation. Maybe we could actually come together. And they worked at it. And so in 1968, they were able to finally come together, which is completely underplayed when you realize the two ends of the, the spectrum that these two come from. It's pretty amazing that they have come together and created the second largest Protestant denomination in the world, over 12 million Methodists. It's a lot of Methodism running around. Now, some of you have probably noticed this, right? You drive around Virginia, and you're like, there's a Methodist church. There's a Methodist church. I challenge you to go to Stanton. There's actually a Methodist church in Stanton. You can stand in the parking lot and see the next Methodist church. They're, very, they're everywhere, right? We're prolific. We were really feeling good at one point and just made a lot of churches. So you can find a lot of Methodist churches here in the United States, especially here in Virginia. We are tied for the second largest annual conference in the world. So we have a lot of Methodists here. But what's beautiful about 1968 is that we really truly recognize that we are a global denomination. And that will be very clear at the next gathering of General Conference in 2024, when the single largest delegation is for the first time in history not from the United States of America. It will be from Africa and the Congo. And so what we find is that we were starting to recognize that things were changing, right? They weren't just changing within Methodism. They were, they were changing with who we were becoming with the Evangelical United Brethren. And they were very prolific up in Philadelphia and up in Pennsylvania. I know a lot of former EUB people from up there. They were here in Virginia too. So some of our people remember growing up as EUB before it became the United Methodist Church. But as we began to recognize the importance of having equality across the globe, that it wasn't just an American denomination, it was a global denomination, we started to have communities that would come up in other places. I remember one time before my son was born, his father and I were trying to find a new Catholic home for him. Catholicism and Methodism worked out really well together because on Saturday night you could go to his church and on Sunday morning you went to mine. Everybody was happy. But when we were trying to find a church, we noticed that this was going to be very hard because I don't know if you've known any Catholics, but sometimes they have a very specific idea of what Catholic worship should look like. And sometimes they have a very specific idea of what the sanctuary where they're going to do that very specific worship should look like. And so I was kind of experiencing this for the first time, that for my son's father, it needed to look like St. Patrick's in Manhattan, which was not easy to find in Williamsburg, Virginia. And so we went to a Ukrainian Orthodox Catholic Church. That was a mouthful. A Ukrainian Orthodox Catholic Church. And this was a cross between Roman Catholicism and the Orthodox traditions. So there was a lot of glorious golden gilded things to look at, which was, I was all fantastic with. But it didn't look like what he was expecting. And so we kept trying. Eventually, we came to St. Bede's, which is a very normative Catholic church in Williamsburg, and we settled there. But what I discovered is that I didn't even realize there were Ukrainian Catholics like this. I didn't even realize that. I realized this week that I had not really paid attention to the fact that there are 10 Ukrainian United Methodist churches. I didn't realize that. 10 United Methodist churches in the Ukraine. And as I started to look at it, I found out that they have all become epicenters where they are located. They are bomb shelters. They are hospitals. They are places where people are living and seeking shelter. They are places that are outposts for providing all kinds of mission work and supplies for these people. And I thought, that is Methodism that is working. That is what we wanted, right? That we wanted to be a people whose faith mattered. We wanted to be a people whose faith had form in our missions and our ministries. 
And the Ukraine right now is a perfect example of that. That's what we wanted. Those communities in which those United Methodist churches sit recognize now in their hour of need that there are a people called Methodists who are with them and for them and them. And that is all every Methodist church I think ever really wanted was to have people recognize that we are with you and for you because our God is with us and for us. So in 1968, when the United Methodist Church came into existence, it was truly a wonderful thing, but it wasn't the end. In fact, one of the most glorious things that the United Methodist Church has ever done happened four years later in 1972 at the very first general conference after the union took place. And there they established what would become the United Methodist Committee on Relief, belovedly referred to as UMCOR. Now, UMCOR is truly a revolutionary and groundbreaking mission work. Because what happens is, in Methodism, once a year, there's a second uh, mile offering that's done on a Sunday, not your regular offering, different offering. And all of the offerings that are given on that Sunday pay completely for all of the costs of UMCOR. They have a very slim staff, and their administrative overhead is very small because they are a part of a global denomination. And so they are able to pay for all of those extra costs. And that's a beautiful thing. That means that when something happens and you see the initiative number for UMCOR, and if you're giving to the Ukraine right now through UMCOR, 100%, every single dollar and penny is going to the Ukraine. They're not pulling out 17% for administrative assistance. They're not doing any of that. All of it is going to the ground. It is going to the people that need it. And that's wonderful. There are a lot of incredible organizations in this world that do a lot of great work. Not going to disparage them. But the truth is that because of the structure of United Methodism, we are able to make it so that anybody, whether you're Methodist or not, is able to donate to UMCOR and not have to worry that it's not all going where it should be. I know Methodists sometimes get caught up on that, right? Where is the money actually going? Sometimes we say that. It's responsible. We're trying to be good stewards. But it's wonderful to be able to turn to somebody and say, oh, you gave to UMCOR? All of it. All of it? All of it. I shared before the story about when I was in Norfolk and at a church, and a lot of my people in that church were in the military. We were five minutes from Norfolk Naval Base. A lot of military there. There was a gentleman in my church who was part of the CBs in the Navy. And after Katrina hit New Orleans, the very next day, he was called up and deployed there to help build and provide relief after Katrina because it was just insane down there. And he was sure, he was so excited. He was like, we're gonna beat the Red Cross. We're gonna get down there first. He said they let him out of the truck and there was the UMCOR tent. And he was like, how did you get there before us? And I was like, honey, we're UMCOR. We're everywhere. And we are. In fact, the last time there was a major natural disaster in Haiti, there was already UMCOR on the ground. When we have had times where we know there's going to be a problem because we are able to actually look a little far ahead now and see where things are happening, they are able to get supplies on the ground before the hurricane hits. And it's amazing that they're able to do that. And all the gifts that come to UMCOR go directly to that. And that's a beautiful thing. That is success as far as our ability to use our polity, our structure, our heart, our passion for Jesus Christ to help people. Now, if you grew up in a Methodist church, you probably remember kits for conference. Remember that? Buying stuff and putting kits together, all kinds of different kits. You had health kits, you had flood bucket kits, you had layout kits for babies, you had um, school kits for kids that needed to be able to have stuff to go to school. You had all kinds of kits. And every year you'd make your kits and then the church would send them to annual conference, that gathering of all the clergy and their lay counterparts each year in Virginia. And you would send those and then you'd be like, and I have no idea what happened now. We sent them off to nowhere. And then you didn't think about them again. And I really didn't think about all those kits that I had made. I didn't even think about the kits that my churches were making that I had been in. I wasn't really thinking about any of those kits. Until a tornado destroyed the town of Joplin, Missouri, where my, my dad grew up. And I can remember when we were finally able to track down our family, our extended family that was living there, we found them through their church. I was able to call their 
pastor and find out that they had made, they connected with them. And found out that, guess what they received? Health kits. That's where they went. Yes, Methodism is a preparatory mission project because we recognize that we get all these things together and then we warehouse them. We make sure that they're temperature controlled and that they're safe and secure. And then when something happens, we ship them right out to the people that need them. And so sure enough, my extended family out in Missouri were able to get kits. I have never again wondered what happens to those kits. Never again. Because I know that they're going to go to somebody who needs it in their hour of need. In their hour of need. That is a success of United Methodism. Now, I sound like a cheerleader of United Methodism. I recognize this. But I'm completely biased. I want to own that right up front. Very biased. Born in the Methodist Church. Baptized in the Methodist Church. Raised in the Methodist Church. I was confirmed in the Methodist Church. The first church I joined when I moved out of my parents' house was a United Methodist Church, called in the Methodist Church, ordained in the Methodist Church, and guess what? I serve in a Methodist Church. Little bit biased for the Methodist Church. I recognize that. I love this church. This is the church not only of my childhood and my youth, but my yearning and my adulthood. This is the church in which I have brought up my child. This is the church in which I serve out and live out my call to ministry. This is an incredible church. And I have to tell you, in the United States, you got a lot of choices. A lot of choices. You could go just about anywhere. I mean, some of them would be like, you're a woman? No. But the rest of them would be like, hey, let's have a talk. So, when you find someone who's committed to the church, it's really a beautiful thing. And the church has grown over time, but now it is in a period of atrophy. And that's what scares us, because we have an important edict. The words of 2 Corinthians are this, that our trespasses have been canceled. Our debt for our sin is canceled. And in its place is the requirement that we have a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is about bringing people together. It is about reminding them that all of us are in a relationship with God and God wants us to be whole. God wants us to be together and connected. It is so important. Entrusting the message of reconciliation to us so we are ambassadors for Christ. Do you ever think about that? Being an ambassador? Now, when I was growing up in Northern Virginia and I was learning to drive, my father used to take me to learn to drive on the Beltway. Thanks, Dad. Not at first, but very quickly, we were on the Beltway. And my father, who, you know, had been living in Northern Virginia and, and working up there, had a very strong particular reaction to diplomat plates because they have immunity. My dad's like, get away from the diplomat. I'm like, I'm in four like, lanes of stop traffic because it's 5 o'clock on a Monday in the Beltway. How can I get away? I can't get away. But my father was pointing out that those were ambassadors. They didn't live by American law. They lived by a different law. We are ambassadors. The laws of the United States are pretty clear. We have laws on top of that as Christians. We are called to go above and beyond what the law of the country requires of us. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We are called to show the world not only who Christ is, but who Christ is in us. Who is Christ in and through you? And that is something entirely different from simply being a card-carrying Methodist. Not that there's any card to carry. Would make life a lot easier, wouldn't it, if you were like, I'm a Methodist. The next time somebody that's not Methodist comes to your door and rings the bell and is like, let's talk to you. You'd be like, oh, no, hold on, wait. Methodist. <laughs> Methodist. It'd be a lot easier. There's no card. When I first got here, I wanted there to be a card so bad because I got here and I had to go visit someone at UVA Medical and they were in the intensive care unit. They were on a ventilator. And as I went to UVA Medical and made my way around that incredible complex, got up to the door and there's a video screen, right, so that the person that's in the nurse's station can see me. And they say to me, who are you here to see? 
And I said, I'm here to see so-and-so. And they said, well, there's already two people back there. Yes, you know, even before the pandemic, they used to limit how many people could be back there. But see, clergy aren't people. So if there's two people allowed back, then we still get to go because we're not people, you know. We don't count. We're not in the head count. However, this person said, you're the pastor. I was like, yes. They're like, you sure you're not the granddaughter? Now, this is a headshot. There's no shoes involved. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I'm the pastor. Where's my card? I'll show you my card. No collar, no card, no nothing. I'm like, I am the pastor. Sure you are, right? So comes and gets me, now sees the shoes, now really doesn't think I'm the pastor. Takes me back to the room. God love the people in the room. The two people in the room who weren't on the ventilator looked up and said, Pastor Sarah, and I went, see? I am the pastor. But the only thing I had, the only credentials I had was the response of the people in that room. I wasn't carrying any card. I didn't have a badge like a Texas Ranger. I didn't have anything but the response of the people that were already there to my presence. They knew who I was, and they spoke that truth. And then I just went, all right, I'm just making sure. Just making sure. We are in that position every single day of our lives. You have no card. You have no credentialing. There's nothing I can give you that you can like put on your car. Because anything that you could buy, which by the way, you can buy anything you want on Amazon. You can buy a clergy collar. You can buy these. You can buy anything you want on Amazon. It doesn't make you clergy, right? You can buy anything you want. It's not going to make you anything. It's how people respond to what you are. People in this world need to know that they can trust us, that we will be there when they need us. Because we're a grace-filled people, we will be there even when they don't. We will be there because we yearn to be with people. We are a people with a ministry of reconciliation. And reconciliation isn't just when things go wrong. Reconciliation is about making sure that things won't go wrong again and again and again. That we are together. We are in this together. And the church is struggling right now to figure out what it's going to be. It's a hard time in the life of the Methodist church. And it's been this way since February of 2019. That was when we had called General Conference. Now, I will tell you that even back in 68, they were having questions about inclusion in the Methodist church. But what they said is, look, we're still trying to make sure everybody's fully ordaining women. We're still trying to make sure that we're not continuing racial prejudice. We're trying to make sure that we can actually like, get along with people who come from a very congregationalist background. We just can't handle one more thing. We just can't handle one more thing. And so since our inception as United Methodists, we have been having this conversation. This conversation has been going on. It just wasn't on the floor of General Conference every year that they convened. But here we are again. We decide, you know what? Once and for all, we're going to have this conversation. So in February of 2019, I and thousands of other Methodists flew out to St. Louis, Missouri to be there on the ground when they made a decision. And when we got there, everybody does things in a different way, right? When I go to General Conference, I like to have a shirt made for every day. So my opening volley was the one that said, Conference Crasher, no voice, no vote, just so everybody knew, <laughs> speaking with no authority. The next day, a lot of other people had arrived. They didn't come for the worship on day one. They came for the discussion on day two. And so on day two, we started to behave very badly on both ends of the spectrum and both aisles. We didn't behave very well toward each other. We were disrespectful of the bishops. We were disrespectful of people when they were having prayer. We started protests. It was not a beautiful thing. It was very disturbing. And so on day three, I decided I was going to wear my shirt that says, United by Grace. That is what ties us together. In fact, it recognizes that none of us are perfect. None of us are good enough. Hence, grace. And we are united in that. Isn't it great to be with somebody else that's as imperfect as you? Isn't it great? Because you can be around perfect people and you're like, I feel a little bit like out of my class. But you are never out of your class in the Methodist church. 
You are always with people who know that they are imperfect because everything we believe, everything we say, everything we do, everything we sing is about grace. And so you know you're with people who are like you, unless you think you're perfect. And then this is going to be an awkward fit. But if you know that you're not, if you know that when God says, even today in the scripture, to you has been entrusted a ministry of reconciliation, then you know that the only perfect one is our God. Amen. And we are serving that. We serve perfection. We are not. Amen. But one day, one day we'd like to get there. So now we're in a position in the church where we're trying to figure out what we're going to do and who we're going to be. And when you look at where we are now, we have done some things really right. Really right. We have done some things that should never be lost. They shouldn't just be recorded in a book of discipline. They should be remembered in the hearts and the minds of whatever Methodists come after us. They are that good, that amazing. That is who we are. What will we be? You'll have to come back next week, I'll tell you. But as of right now, the work actually begins. Who are we? Who are we as individuals? Who are we as a local church? Who are we as the United Methodist Church? Who are we? Now, last week I said, when in doubt, love. If you don't know the answer, love. If you're not sure what Jesus would have you do, fail safe is love. When in doubt, love. So, if we become a people who default to that, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to love you. It's hard to do. It is not easy to do, to default to love. I tried it out on your behalf. Now, I'll admit to you, I tried it out on somebody to whom I am related, so it's kind of a false start. But it's a lot easier to try to love somebody that you're supposed to love, right? Because you know you're supposed to love them and because your parents are telling you you're supposed to love them. So you try to love them. And I tried it, and I was like, hey, this is kind of working. This could be a thing. So I've done a, a, a soft, soft opening on leading with love, and I'm feeling confident. I'm going to try it with my son later today. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> but try that. Lead with love. Because, again, your only credentials is the response from the people in the room. And when you lead with love, whether they agree with you, whether they like what you did, whether they think that you did it well enough, they have to acknowledge that you did it with love, that you love. And not only are they acknowledging it, but God acknowledges that. You tried to love. You tried. Even Peter tried to love Jesus and go, you can't die. Why are you saying that you're going to die? You can't die. We love you and we need you. And you love us. You can't die. Because he loved. He was wrong, but he was leading with love. And Jesus was like, you don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're saying. So lead with love. Because you know what? Peter messed up on that one, but Jesus kept giving him more chances because he led with love. May your life be the same. May you lead with love. And may you discover that all the credentialing and identity you ever need will be from the people in the room when you lead with love. And not only will they tell you who you are, a lover of people, a lover of children, a lover of sinners and those who are lost and gone astray, a lover of people who feel outcast and unwanted, a lover of people no matter who they are because of God's grace. But they will start to tell others about who you are. And that is the testimony of our faith. When people know who you are, you are a Christian. You go to that church. You do this ministry. You are part of this mission work. That is how they know who you are. But all of that, all of those things are supposed to be about love. There's a wonderful hymn that I once heard. They will know we are Christians by our not our doctrine, not our polity, not our position on the political scale. They will only know we are Christians by our love. May it be so.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I've missed you, Marie. I can't tell you. I missed you. I'm so glad you are back. All right, we are going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And as we do this, it's a wonderful time to be in prayer about where are these gifts going to go and who are they going to help and who's going to experience God's love and grace because of our offerings this day. Let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Please stand as you are able for the doxology. As we come before you, we are in awe of all that you have already given to us. You have given of yourself in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have forgiven us every sin, every trespass, every mistake and false step. And Lord, as we give these gifts to you, whether those that are on your altar now or given through the gift of technology, we recognize, Lord, that we are turning over to you a portion of our blessing in the hope and the security of knowing that you take our blessings and multiply them that others would know that you are Lord and that you are the one who loves through all people for all time. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to share with you a few quick announcements. So today, before this worship service, we had a fellowship opportunity to try to get some cross-pollinization and connection and fellowship between the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock. There is a plethora of food in there available, and you are welcome to get it and take it home. There's Bodo's Bagels. So please feel free, um, especially if you are hungry after this. We would love to have you take that. There's fresh fruit, there's donuts, bagels, the whole deal. You're welcome to have that and take that home. And we hope to do that again soon. Our church council was gracious enough to host that. And it was a, a real success with the kids. And we hope to do that again soon and give you more notice on that one. Our Sights and Sounds Theater simulcast, going to update you that. This is the Sight and Sound Theater. They're doing a performance of David, the story of King David's ascent to the throne. It's a performance that contains a lot of special effects and live animals on the TV, not in the church live animals, and we are going to do two showings of this over Labor Day weekend. So on Friday night, September 2nd at 7 p.m., we're going to hold the first one. Then there will be an encore performance Sunday of Labor Day weekend at 3 o'clock, and so you're welcome to come to this. It is free. We will have popcorn for you, and if you need more information or you want to get, make sure that you're on there to come, you can talk to Gary. Gary at CrozetUnitedMethodist.org, and we look forward to gathering our family together and seeing this incredible display of the scriptures. 
Our United Women in Faith are getting ready to have their yard and bake sale, and that is scheduled for October 1st, that they've got a limited number of vendor spots available. So if you are interested in selling some of your wares there, you need to contact Judy Hoberg, and we have her email, and we can also put you in touch with her. And if you miss this information, you can always call the church office, and we will make sure to connect you. And then lastly, our middle school youth are back here tonight on our campus at 5.30 out on the plaza, where they will be engaging in live-action Hungry Hungry Hippos should be special. We'll see how that goes. Sign up for Tables for Eight in our Realm software. Um, we've had a lot of response for that. Looking forward to those dinner opportunities to gather for food and fellowship and uh, make some deeper connections. Wonderful opportunity there. So thank you for those who have already signed up for that. And then our small group survey is still out there. Rather than simply telling you what we're going to do and expecting you to jump in there, we're going to be asking what your preferences are and what your interests are so that we can make sure that we provide those experiences for you. And you might be surprised how many other people have those same interests. So please fill that out. And if you need any help with either of those two things, you can always call us at the church office or email us at office at crozetunitedmethodist.org, and we will be happy to connect with you there. So we have come to the point where we conclude our total requests. And I think we've done this one before. Gary, is that true? Have we sung this one before? Did we sing this one already in the requests? Yeah. We have? All right, well, it's back for an encore. It's going to be an encore. We are going to invite you to stand as you are able and sing with us Victory in Jesus. Number 37 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
this is a wonderful version of the idea that Jesus has come to set us free and empowered us to love as we have been loved. Will you receive this benediction? You who God knows and loves, may you realize that when you go forth from this place, others that God knows and loves need to experience Jesus Christ in you. Show them what Christ means and how you forgive, how you love, and how you live. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen.